Yeah, that's fine. I will um, perhaps go a bit into some um, theoretical understanding behind this as we go through the, the steps of the tutorial, uh, because that might have been not so obvious depending on how much you remember from machine learning. And so, um, yeah, and after this, starting at 3.30, um, Lucas and Niklas will continue with then the next part of this tutorial. So, uh, yeah, the, the code and the, the solution is found on the course page here already, and there's also a setup document. So these three files you can get also on your own machine, and I will go through basically the solution document. Okay, this is not what I want there. Okay, so this is, um, yeah, let's start with this. We have this uh, markdown file that explains the, the setup. I think for... you have to scale that up. Sorry? I think you have to scale that up. Quite ah, a yeah. bit. That is a good idea. Hang on. Okay, this is not scalable, but this should be, uh... nope. No worries, we have enough time. Ah, this, this. Okay, I think this is getting better. Then we can close this for now. Is this somewhat legible or should it be further scaled up? Maybe, maybe one more. Okay. Like this? That's fine for you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, if it, uh, maybe again, show of hands, who has uh, run this code already on on a machine of their own? Two. Two. Okay. Then, yeah, but I guess most of you haven't yet, so I'll quickly run through this. So. Yeah. You have run. Have you have run. Okay. Uh, four. Four then. Okay. <laughs> so basically, uh, yeah, th th this file explains um, hopefully question? how. Maybe question? Of the setup, uh, yeah. Should we also have the GPU version running of TensorFlow? So uh, if you have a GPU, then you can try it. So with CUDA support and so on. If you have a CUDA capable yeah, okay. CPU, GPU, then yes, you can run it. But uh, I don't think it's necessary for this model. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, for the for the at least first several sessions, you won't need a GPU. And when you do some, or if you do something that requires one, then you will be able to run it on, on our machines. So you don't need to have a GPU at your end and you don't necessarily need the GPU setup. Of course, you can do that if you want to play around with more uh, complicated computations already. Okay, so um, yeah, the, basically the idea is to, to set up a virtual environment you can use uh, you, you can do that using the VNF module, or you can use it with uh, you can do something like Conda, or um, there's poetry now. There is a, a white forest of uh, Python uh, environment management software. I will quickly show my workflow here. Okay, it's. So I've, I've already done this, but uh, basically I just found out to manage the environments. It would mean uh, should be somewhere in my yeah. Basically, I gave it the name PDLT for Big Data and Language Technologies and created this. Then I activated it, which VS Code already did here. And then you can just continue with pip to install the um, requirements. We have this requirements file linked in the um, in the markdown file here. So you can download this. Oh, that didn't work, but it should work from here then at least. Yeah, you just need this URL and download that to the working directory. Okay, it's already there, of course. So nothing needs to happen for now. And yeah, once that is done, it is a good idea to make sure the latest version of pip is installed. That 
wasn't even done yet. And then you can install the requirements listed in this file, which aren't too many for now. So we have TensorFlow scikit-learn and so on. Um, yeah, just hand this over to Pip and then in my case, this was already installed, so it was very quick. If you want to run this notebook in VS Code, you should also install the um, IPy kernel module in addition to that, but that is also already done in my case. So, and then, yeah, right, you, you can either run this to run a, st a standalone uh, Jupyter that you can visit in your browser or like I'm going to do here, you can open the notebook file in Visual Studio Code and that also works quite well. So um, yeah, this, uh, all right, I'm going to open a thing on the side here so I can kind of have a blackboard or a whiteboard or whatever. Um, yeah, in this um, first tutorial, we are going to um, do some very basic uh, text sequence classification. And uh, the text that we have is a collection of movie reviews from IMDb. And um, each of these have a, a label positive or negative. So these are reviews that have a you know, positive opinion about the movie that, that they are talking about or a negative one. And uh, we want to train a neural network that uh, can correctly classify movie reviews into positive or negative based on this. So in this notebook, we had um, basically downloading and pre-processing this data set and then building a basic TensorFlow model using the Keras API and then uh, yeah, we would evaluate this and run this on, on new text essentially. So this, um, for this purpose, we start with um, importing some packages that we need. This is mostly pandas and numpy for basic data processing, TensorFlow and scikit-learn for the training test split later. Uh, then we had a cell here to download and unpack the data set. If you want to do this, you have to un uh, uncomment these two lines. The, the exclamation mark in the beginning says this line is a shell command that is then executed as a subprocess of the Python interpreter, but not interpreted as Python code. So this uh, the curl command downloads a file from the internet. This is the URL where this uh, IMDB dataset is available as a tar archive, and then we unpack it in the directory right here. In this case, I've already done this, so I can just show you that this is the tar file that I downloaded. Here's the folder. This, uh, oops, sorry, that was maybe loud if I hit my microphone. If so, sorry. Uh, this folder contains two subfolders, test and train. So this is the um, sub data set, so to speak, that they prepared for testing and training. And then each of these contains uh, two subfolders um, with negative and positive label. And here's apparently an additional one, but I think we're not using that. And then in these, there are a bunch of, uh, yeah, a large amount of text files. There are so many that it even takes a while to list them. and. These have a file name with the ID of the movie.txt, uh, and then the content of the file is simply the text of the review. So this first negative review then is apparently about some Kevin Costner film that the person didn't like, and then they go on a lot about how much they didn't like it. Um, yeah, so what the first thing we want to do is basically read all these individual files into a uh, nice columnar format that we can easily work with going forward. So I'm going to close this large annoying folder again, and then we proceed here. So yeah, I, I have the, the solution already in here in the, in the first notebook. This is empty, so for you to practice it if you like. And um, yeah, in future sessions, we will 
make this even more interactive, I think. So in that sense, it's probably a good idea to, to bring a laptop to the, to the seminar in any case. So yeah, the, the code for this is pretty straightforward. We have a Python list where we want to uh, keep all the individual uh, reviews in the data set. And this we will then turn into a pandas data frame at the end. And we fill this list basically by looping through the, the train and test uh, sets and the negative and positive label. And when, then we just have to go into the data set folder at the uh, train or test set and negative or positive label, and then grab all of the text files that are inside this um, respective folder. And then the ID of the file is the stem. So that is something the, the pathlib library from Python provides, which is the base name without the extension. So this bit before the .txt. And the text of the review then, of course, is the contents of the file. So we just have to open it for reading and read it all in. And then each um, document in our data set is represented by the ID, by the text, and then by the label and uh, train test subset that we are looping through here. And with this call, we take, uh, turn this into a data frame with, with the columns labeled as you would expect. And then we get 50,000 elements in this data set in total, each with these uh, four columns. And then we need to pre-process the data a little bit to um, actually make this um, accessible to a, uh, to a neural network. So for this, the first um, thing that we are going to do is some tokenization. I think on the side here, I will um, do a little bit of one second. Um, I, I, will, I will develop a more simple example in, in parallel here that illustrates what we want to do. So for here, let's, oops, this is a bit too thick. I'll zoom out a bit. Yeah, this is okay. So our tokenization is going to take our texts and first of all, turn them into sequences of numbers. So we will do this in a very basic fashion. Let's assume for now that our data set is much more simple. Let's say we have the text. I love my cat and I love dogs, let's say. And uh, for tokenization, we will simply uh, split up the individual words and uh, turn this into a vector of the index into the vocabulary. So that means in this case, the vocabulary has uh, cat, dogs, I love my, and we just number them in, for example, alphabetical order, but it doesn't really matter. And that means we have these five um, elements in our vocabulary. So that means these two texts become uh, the sequence three, four, five, one, and the sequence um, three, four, two. Then um, basically the, the same goes for the, for the labels as well. We want to turn the, okay, I guess these are both positive uh, examples then. In our case, we want to turn the labels into numbers as well. And we will, this was in this cell. I already ran this earlier and I'm not going to go into detail on every single one. Um, since you also have the video from Lucas where he explains the steps, uh, we have here replaced this, the string negative by zero and positive by one. So these would both get a, a oops, pen was a bit slow here, get a one. And then these would, what our training examples look like. So then um, for the purpose of the model that we are working with here, we need all sequences to be the same length. In this case, we decided to append zeros. So let's say, um, yeah, we, we said here we want a, a sequence length of 256. I'm just going to use four here. So that means uh, when we pad this uh, 
first sentence that already has four tokens, nothing happens. And when we pound the second sentence, it gets a zero at the end. So then we did the train test split. This I'm not going to repeat on the side here. But basically, we, we held out 20% of the training part of the, the of the input data for validation. And then um, the key part essentially was uh, building a, a neural network that learns this classification task. So that means the input would be a sequence like this and the output would be somehow a number between zero and one that characterizes how negative or positive the model considers the, the review to be. So um, we use this uh, keras.sequential API. So this basically defines a model that uh, one after another applies different functions to the input. And in our case, we start with a uh, an embedding layer. So this is a function that turns these uh, discrete uh, token ID numbers into a dense representation that the model can work with better. So I guess, first of all, we should ask why, uh, yeah, so this is the embedding step. First of all, we should ask why this uh, these numbers uh, aren't useful to a neural model directly. Uh, one big reason for that is that um, these numer numeric values imply some uh, meaning to to the to the sequence. So that means is the token one in some uh, reasonably uh, reasonable sense uh, smaller than the token two and uh, yeah, in this case, not really. So it um, makes more sense to consider the different words somehow uh, different dimensions. One simple way to do this would be to, first of all, so if we are going to continue with the first sentence here, could uh, transform this into a uh, space where every um, word in the vocabulary has its own dimension. So then we would get a sequence of one hot vectors instead. That means we would have a um, number of rows corresponding to the number of words in the vocabulary and a number of columns um, corresponding to the length of the sequence. So that would be four in this case. And then out of the three, we would make the vector zero, zero, one, zero, zero. 0. So that means the uh, fourth word is present in this position, uh, the third word, sorry, and the others are not. And um, the same for the for the other um, vectors in the sequence. So that, and this is a one in the Maybe first position. For the audience, yeah. what, what is, what would be um, a disadvantage of this uh, way of representing the words? Size. The size could be one, yes. So you would need huge ve vectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another, another one. This, might there be an assorting problem? Like, it kind of depends how the vocabulary is sorted. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that is that is an issue, but. Uh, you might also see that they're all completely orthogonal, so yeah. uh, you can't really calculate anything with them. Right, yeah. Okay, and the, yeah, the way around this is essentially what the, the first embedding layer in our model does here, which um, I'm going to call the result of applying this embedding uh, y with upper index e and this results from um, multiplying and one, one question matrix. what is now the, the biggest disadvantage uh, was this care is this uh, a question for the audience 
Yeah, also uh, perhaps a repetition. It was already asked. Uh, we should say it simply. It's the size, in fact, and the sparsity. The size yeah. and the sparsity, yeah. So How uh, other things yeah. are maintained. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. In uh, So this five here, the number of, of rows is our vocabulary yes, size, I'm right? Another question, yeah. So it's not useful if the matrix would be a partner. It's 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 so um, maybe you know this thing where you can do calculations with these vectors, uh, yeah. like king and queen have the same distance as man and woman, for example, yeah. but yeah. in different parts of the vector space. You can't do that with this. Yeah. So also good Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Sorry, so uh, continue, Yannick. Yeah, because, I mean, basically, this is just a different representation of the arbitrary numbers we had before, just yeah. way larger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, right. So, um, yeah, this, this, um, this semantic relatedness of vectors uh, maybe can be illustrated if you. Um, let's say, compare uh, the sentences. I like cats and uh, I like dogs and I like uh, cars, right? So in the 100 representation, each pair of these sentences have the exact same distance from each other, right? So this, um, yeah, no, okay, this is a five-dimensional coordinate system, so it's a bit weird. But let's say the, the on the I like axis, they are both uh, all three sentences are the same. This one is uh, one along the cat axis. This one is one along the dog axis and zero along the cat axis. Uh, and this one is zero along the dog and cars axis. And this one is one along the cars axis. And uh, no. Uh, zero along the other two. But um, this isn't actually a good representation of the real world, right? Because um, arguably the word cats and dogs are much uh, closer in meaning than the word cats and cars or dogs and cars. So um, that's uh, the, the sparsity problem that a more dense representation uh, seeks to alleviate. And the size problem uh, just uh, realized that this five here, which is the number of words in our artificial vocabulary in any real world setting is much, much larger than that, right? So maybe we can quickly look at how, uh, what the number in these, um, in this uh, IMDB dataset is, which is the length of the tokenizers word index. So here we have, uh, okay, I have to fit this again. Uh, okay, sorry. I guess my kernel restarted with, yeah, my kernel restarted without me noticing, then I have to run my cells again. This will take a second. Okay, now it's downloading this again. This is annoying. And I would rather interrupt this, I think. Oh no, this was also not necessary. Ah, oh, wait, yes. Okay. No problem. This is all the pre-processing that we just talked about once again. It's complaining about the missing GPU setup here also. And yeah, we have 124,000 different words in the vocabulary. Also because we didn't do any uh, normalization like uh, case folding or any stuff like that. So even if you took a bit more care, you would still have tens of thousands of different uh, tokens. And uh, of course that makes this 
matrix extremely sparse, right? And also the sequence length here is 200 instead of four, so 256. So you already have like uh, tens of millions of elements in this uh, one not representation of a single input sentence. And that also is not very efficient. So that's, um, yeah, the other thing that this embedding layer accomplishes. I'm going to put this in a different color because this is actually the first set of parameters that our model has. I want to highlight this. So our embedding uh, dimension, I'm going to stick with the 16 that we have there. Um, so this uh, this WE is a, or it's not exactly implemented like that in Keras. So it, Keras omits uh, going, uh, actually materializing this uh, one hot matrix, but semantically it works exactly like this. Um, the uh, embedding matrix has um, as many rows as we have dimensions in our, our embedding. So this is a parameter we can choose. We've chosen 16 here in this case. And uh, as many columns as we have uh, different uh, entries in our vocabulary, in our toy example here, this was five. And this multiplied with a single um, example in five by four um, gives us our um, embedded uh, y vector here, which then would be uh, 16 by four. So number of uh, elements in the vocabulary times, uh, no, sorry, number of embedding dimensions times uh, sequence length. So still every column of this uh, corresponds to a word in the input. So this would still be the, uh, I love my cat, but now we have some um, arbitrary numbers here and only 16 of them per word. The elements of this embedding matrix, we will start with by simply uh, choosing random numbers here. So you could pick them from a normal distribution, for example, that is fairly typical, but there's a, a large amount of theory and on initialization as well. And uh, I'm not going to go into much further detail. But anyway, if we are, so let's, let's call this here X, just for, uh, oops likes of it sometimes. So that means the, the first thing that our network does here is multiply our embedding matrix by X. And X is the, the input sequence in the most basic representation. And then we have uh, our Y embedded here. Okay. So now we, um, with this call model.add, we uh, add this as a layer uh, to our network. Oh, I clicked something that I shouldn't have, sorry. There. And so now um, we want to process these sequences, but um, we, yeah, let's say we don't know a lot of um, actual uh, neural network technology for sequence processing yet. So we want to use a simple feed forward network. And for that, we would like to get rid of the sequence dimension and somehow represent the information in the sequence in a single vector. And for that, um, in the tutorial, we use this global average pooling uh, layer, which um, yeah, essentially averages along the uh, sequence axis. So let's add this here as a next step that we are going to call pooling. And um, then I will let's call this YP. And um, yeah, this is going to be a uh, one by 16. So we'll have still as many rows as we have embedding dimensions, but we will collapse all the four uh, sequence elements into one. And uh, the way I'm going to write this is a little bit awkward, but I hope that makes it clear what happens. We sum over the uh, J columns of the YE vector in the uh, first row and in the Jth column. And then we do this for all the 16 elements of this uh, row vector, uh, this column vector, sorry. And in the last row, 
of it. So in the, the last element, we do the same thing, except here we take the, whoops, the 16th row of Y and every column of that one. And this layer has no parameters, as you can see. So this is a an operation that is always the same, no matter what the network is learned. So then finally, uh, yeah, I'm going to annotate here also that this has one column in the end. Um, yeah, on top of this, we will build a feed forward network that, um, so I'm, uh, Lucas labeled this dense layer. You could also label this hidden layer. This is a bit uh, more in, in line with the terminology we use in the lecture. So I might use that. It's a fully connected layer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you, Michael, that you point these connections. Yeah, hidden layer is also fine for you connected, also active, also, but um, hmm. hidden is nice. Okay, so this um, would mean uh, we take this vector yip that we just got out of the pooling operation, we put this to a set of parameters that I'm going to call w hidden, and then we will get a vector out of it again that is the same uh, shape and is called y hidden then. Okay, I should probably make sure I actually run all these cells so nothing goes wrong later. And then um, we want to apply a, a non-linearity uh, non to the result. So this is again just a matrix multiplication. So this is uh, 16 by one, this is, uh, oops, and is gone. This is also 16 by one. And that means these, uh, this set of parameters needs to be 16 by 16, right? And the, um, yeah, writing this in mathematical terms, we have yh equals uh, wh times yp. And then we said we want to apply nonlinearity. In this case, we chose the ReLU function, which uh, looks like this plot here. So basically it, it, we map uh, element wise, the, the elements of this uh, 16 by one uh, common vector to zero if they are zero or less and to, uh, to themselves otherwise. So this is a, a linear for positive values basically. Again, I'm going to highlight this. This is a set of parameters that our model has. Um, right. So, and this is the, the, the hidden layer of the network essentially. And, um, you know, there's really nothing much more to say about this. I think we will go into some more rigorous detail in this, in a, on this, in the, in the lecture part, however, and you probably heard some version of this in the machine learning lecture as well but we will review it once again. Um, right, this dropout layer is essentially a regularization technique that um, doesn't make a significant difference to how the mathematical formulation of our model works. So I'm going to, oops, this was supposed to be in black again. I am going to uh, skip this here. What this does is um, pick 10% uh, of the values in the in the input. In this case, the input is the result of this value operation and set them to zero during training. This um, is mainly for the purpose of helping to avoid overfitting. So this makes the model more robust in the sense that uh, since some of the activations will randomly be missing, it um, will hopefully learn um, a set of representations that work even in the presence of noise. So yeah, I'm going to write dropout in brackets. We omit this from here. And then we come to the output layer of the network. Here we decided to use the um, sigmoid activation because we want a value between zero and one, right? This is our classification. Um, zero is negative sentiment, one is positive sentiment. And um, the shape of the output then is supposed to be a scalar. So we want 
uh, we get as input this one by 16 uh, vector yh. Uh, gets a bit laggy sometimes, but this is fine. Um, then we pass this to a set of parameters for this layer and we get as output a scalar or one by one vector that we can then feed through our sigmoid activation. So this um, I'm going to call W, no, sorry, WO. Ah, let's do this properly. The um, output layer matrix and to get the shapes to match, we uh, need this to have uh, one row and 16 columns. And then I'm going to call this uh, just Y because this is also the final output of our network. Here we said we apply the sigmoid nonlinearity to the result of the multiplication of WO with uh, YH from the previous oops, layer. And then if I click the correct cells, the model summary should show this. So uh, this table that, that Giras prints out when you um, yeah, have it summarized, the model definition gives you an overview of the, the shapes of the parameter matrices. As you can see, the parameter count in the embedding layer is by far the highest because um, the embedding matrix here uh, contains, um, the way we've written it here now, contains as many columns as there are different words in the vocabulary. So this would be hundreds of thousands, right? I think I had it on the notebook here a little ways up. Okay, I think it was 124,000. Can't immediately find it, but never mind. And this multiplied by the uh, number of embedding dimensions that we want, which is here also 16. So clearly you get uh, millions of parameters in the in the embedding matrix. Then the, yeah, the pooling layer has no parameters. The dense or hidden layer then has um, uh, yeah, a bit more than 16 by 16 parameters. This is a detail I've omitted here is that we also have a, have a bias for every uh, row of this uh, uh, of this output vector, in the lecture we um, to make them to make the math uh, more readable, we uh, add essentially a an additional um, column of ones to the to the input to to operationalize the bias, and then the um, the corresponding parameter matrix gets an additional row. But uh, that just as an aside, and uh, yeah, the same holds for the for the output layer. This has uh, seventeen parameters, sixteen from the uh, transformation of what goes into it, and one for the bias. But the idea is clear without it, and the the math is more readable. So I've omitted this here. The um, uh, yeah, the the key thing I guess is that we can write this entire network as a single equation if we want. And uh, at the level of complexity that we have here, it's still somewhat possible to fit this on a screen. So let's try. So we have in the final layer, we have the, the sigmoid function, which we apply to the result of the matrix multiplication between the um, output layer weights and the uh, value activation of uh, the multiplication of the hidden layer weights with, and then comes this um, vector with the result of the pooling operation, which was the sum over the columns of, um, I'm going to leave this blank for a second. And of that, we take the uh, first row and the jth column and sum up all the, the j columns. And that which goes in here finally is the um, embedding matrix multiplied by x. And then we have this 
thing here 16 times with um, the different rows of the embedding. So, uh, oops, that was. So this um, summarizes everything that this network does in a single equation. And uh, I can and probably should write this as a function of x. And uh, all of the w things in here then are our parameters. And then I guess you might wonder why am I so interested in writing this as a single equation. This is um, ultimately key when we want to actually train this network. So at this point, we have written down how the forward uh, computation works. So given an x, what is our prediction for the, for the class based on the parameters? And um, if we can do that, we can take some example x where we know the correct answer and then we can compute an error the um or or a loss as it's also Michael, often can I called. just interrupt you here on yeah. the short i like mm -hmm. very much that you explain exactly what happens and for those who are annoyed from this mass takes the time it makes sense those who understand how michael composed these uh, matrices to compute y of x and this is the only thing it's simply a function those who understand this they can go to the next step and develop neural networks that work because um, in at heart we're doing regression here and we have an x we enter this in y and we try to approximate the weight such that the error becomes small and if you yeah. understand how it, this is built, you understand the function much better. And okay, this that, uh, mm, brings you more to, to an understanding mathematician's view than from a simply application. Uh, so, sorry for interrupting you. Yes, there's, a, there's a question. Yeah, pooling can be applied for every layer or? Pooling? Uh, professor have showed us average pooling, right? In the, in the slide. Yeah. So it should be applied for every layer, like at the end of every layer or? Uh, no, you don't want to pool every layer. And also in pooling, like I remember we have average max pooling and all that, so which is best? I think you might be, um, <laughs> if you've had prior exposure to, to neural networks in the Im image processing context, like for, for computer vision, say, there you have um, pooling operations with more than um, one dimension. Yeah. And, yeah, that, that works slightly differently, but but still, uh, the pooling operation uh, doesn't have any parameters there either, if I'm not mistaken. It's just a dimensionality reduction, and also, basically. And also, for the in the slide, I've seen that vocab size plus one you have taken, right? While demonstrating about word embeddings. Mm -hmm. So why is that? I mean, in this, I, it, it's that. The I don't think I heard this quite clearly. Why is what? So, like, while considering about the uh, weight vector, mm -hmm. we have taken vocab size plus one, right? The size. Yeah. So, why is that? Like, why have considered one more? Uh, I see. Yes. Because of the. Um, uh, maybe I, I can explain this in a um, simple it's setting. About indexing, indexing scenario, or why one you have considered more? So um, assume that um, your x has only a single dimension, right? And yeah. your, uh, your y as well. So, so, so then your, your training data might look like somehow points in the, in the one dimensional coordinate system. Um, if your w has exactly the same amount of dimensions of x, that means um, you would have one parameter in this case, right? And with one parameter, the, the best uh, you could do um, is let's say multiply the parameter by X and that would give you a line through the origin. And if you, uh, if the value of the parameter changes, then you get, uh, then you can represent different lines through the origin. But um, the data might not actually be sym symmetric to the origin. So in this case that I drew here, it is not. 
So we want a second parameter that uh, is not multiplied by x, and that is so. So the the model here would be uh, w one times x, right? You want an additional parameter w zero that you that you add to this, um, and that allows you to to represent lines that uh, don't go through the origin. So, so that you could have one uh, here or one here that fits this this uh, this point cloud in terms of uh, distance much better. Uh, we, we also had the same thing in the linear regression in the machine learning course, if you remember, maybe. Um, yeah. One small question. The dropout is just neglected in the uh, function, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. I, um, I omitted this here also because in uh, prediction, you uh, might not actually use. Yeah, yeah, you don't you don't do that in prediction. And it's also hard to represent it as a function because it's yeah. random. Yeah. yeah. But essentially, uh, what it would do is take, uh, I think, this vector here, and then randomly replace 10% of the elements with with zeros. And but a different 10% on each uh, training yeah. iteration. Uh, just zeros or flip? So, for example, that some mm. exams are also uh, no, you usually zero out the weight so they don't yeah. propagate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we are we are talking about the um, the the features or the the inner representation of the features. We're not talking about the classes. So, if that's what you meant by flipping, then then no. Activations, right? The weights, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, okay. I don't have the, the docs at hand here, but in the in the Keras documentation, you can also read up on this. Okay. Um, right. So, so I guess the uh, are there still questions? Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I Benno, uh, this is Benno. I have a question, yeah. Michael. Um, and this uh, yeah. error curve which I see there is this um, just an example, or does it belong to this example? Uh, most certainly doesn't belong to this example. So okay, uh, yeah, that's fine. This is some arbitrary three-dimensional function, I would say, right? Um, okay. So, um, yeah, with the relevance of this, I guess we are, we are getting to right now. So, so now the question is, um, I said earlier, we initialize, oh, these are not red anymore. Let's quickly adjust this. Um, we, we take these, these parameter matrices. We saw here we have... Um, a couple million parameters. And uh, I said earlier, we initialize these two random numbers somehow to start. And clearly, that gives us a function that most likely does not, uh, for every movie review x here, produces the, the correct sentiment in the data set. But we can take uh, the movie reviews from the data set, feed them through this function, get uh, a number between 0 and 1, and then measure how close this is to the actual sentiment of the review, so to the 0 or to the 1. Um, yeah, by measuring this, uh, this corresponds to computing a loss. And um, based on this loss, we can then slightly modify this function. And the way we can modify it is uh, modifying the elements in these parameter matrices that, uh, that make up the, the space of functions that we are interested in here. And um, so, so the, the error is a scalar value that um, measures how close in uh, across the entire data set this function was to predicting the correct sentiment in every case and uh, yeah if we were to plot this we would have a coordinate system with as many dimensions as we have parameters so that means in this case almost uh, two million yeah yeah almost uh, two million axes so i can't draw this so let's assume we have just two parameters Still confused with the colors in this thing. Let's assume we have uh, two parameters. I'm going to call them W0 and W1. And as a third axis, we have the, the loss or error that we have computed for one training iteration. Um, then um, we will have a... Uh, yeah, kind of a, a landscape over the parameter space where uh, for some configurations of parameters, the loss of the model is, is higher. So we make more mistakes, or are further away from 100% uh, correct classifications. And in some configurations of parameters, the loss is lower. 
And um, since this function, despite its um, large complexity is still differentiable, we can compute a gradient that tells us uh, if we make a slight modification of the parameters in some direction, uh, would the loss go up or down? The problem with that is that this is certainly not a convex function, so we don't have a single global minimum of the loss, but we would rather have some uh, weird, um, yeah, it's uh, still in two dimensions, it's a bit hard to draw, uh, some uh, yeah, complex landscape with many local minima. So um, yeah, the best we can do essentially is pick some random starting point in, in this uh, parameter plane and figure out how the loss of the model is there and then modify it in a direction that makes the model better until at some point this doesn't work anymore. This would be the, the basic gradient descent procedure for which we'll get into more detail later on in the session, which you might have heard about already. The actual optimizer we use here is called ADAM, which is um, a slightly more refined version of the gradient descent procedure, which can uh, uh, handle in some cases getting stuck in local min uh, minima, for instance. But there's um, no perfect solution for this. Anyway, so the compile method here sets up the model for optimization by telling it which optimizer and which loss function we want and which metric we want to optimize, which is uh, accuracy in this case. So um, correct classifications. This, since we are a little bit short on time and since you can watch the recording where Lucas explains the implementation aspects of this, I will kind of just skip through this quickly. So essentially the, the implementation of this uh, model fitting is quite straightforward with Keras. But uh, so this is basically what is happening here that we are moving down this uh, this loss gradient over several epochs of the model um, of the training, right? We have this, um, we have these callbacks functions that I haven't explained now, but again, this is in the previous recording. We don't need me to explain this again. This will cause our um, training process to terminate at some point when the loss doesn't change sufficiently anymore. To while this runs, let's see what else we have here. Oh, yeah, we, we used the, the model for predicting in the end. So, oh. Zoom is complaining about CPU usage. Okay, but I think it's, ah, okay. This might have terminated now, but we can load it from the latest checkpoint. Then we can evaluate it on the, the test data set. So we reached an accuracy of 0.88. So that means 88% correct classifications of the uh, samples in the test data set. And then the final thing we looked at that I can also quickly show here is the, we can use this model now then to also classify arbitrary text strings that we supply. So we have a simple function here that uh, uses the same tokenizer that we use to pre-process our, um, our training data set. Uh, and then uh, that tokenizes some set of input strings that we give here into the, uh, into the same uh, vocabulary indices. And then we, again, do this uh, sequence padding where we fill them up with zero to all the same length. And then we can fit this to uh, feed this to our model prediction function. So model.predict is this uh, y of x here. One aspect that I also omitted here is that this also works on batches of sequences. So essentially, if you um, add an additional dimension to turn this from vectors and matrices to matrices and uh, 
well, essentially um, third, uh, third order tensors, then you can represent also a an axis that corresponds to different training examples. And this is good for, let's say, implementation on a GPU, where this is more efficient than looping over individual samples. In any case, we can run this function of individual uh, on individual sentences. So we have three input sentences here. This is a good test sentence. This is a perfect test sentence. This is a bad, bad test sentence. And so in this sense, it picks up the, the good, perfect, bad distinction already. So this is a, um, this is a slightly, uh, sorry, slightly positive score. Ah, right. Something I forgot to mention. This is a transformation that we did in the end. We um, take this uh, output of model.predict, which is a number between zero and one because of the sigmoid, right? We double this and subtract one so that um, we a little bit more easily can see which is uh, classified as positive and negative by the model because if it's 0 0.5 here, we get exactly zero, right? If it's below 0 0.5, we get something negative. If it's above, we get something positive. So that means, um, these first two sentences are classified as positive and the final one as uh, quite negative. But uh, I think we also had a bunch of cases where this didn't work. So of course, in a trivially simple model like this, that uh, for example, does not consider word order in any way, which you can see in this uh, pooling operation, right? So we simply average over the sequence elements. So obviously word order is lost. And that means it's not possible to represent something like the phrase uh, not bad in a model like this. And accordingly, this is classified as negative. Okay, then our time is almost up. We could have a short uh, question session if you still have questions. And Any otherwise questions? it's maybe, yeah. No. No questions, okay then. Maybe it's a good idea to take a short break before the next session at uh, 3.30 starts. So this is already rather soon now. Thank you, Michael. Thank you also from my side.